This is Twit. Let's uh, move along to talk about iOS 15.4. That's right. Apple has released the latest version of iOS 15.4, iPadOS 15.4, also new version of HomePod software, uh, tvOS, watchOS, and macOS. Um, we're going to cover the iOS 15.4 updates because that also ends up covering the iPadOS updates as well. And uh, this first one is for folks who use... Um, your, who use the built-in password mechanics that uh, iOS provides. So password saving uh, now has an extra feature. You want to tell us about that, Rosemary? Yes. So I actually saw this tweeted by one of the developers who actually works on this at Apple. Um, and he said that um, there are now notes in the password app on uh, iOS. So I'm just going to pop open my password manager. And I think I've hidden the example one that I created last time, which is most unfortunate. So I'll just start by creating a brand new password here so that I can show people. So I'll just put in example.com um, because otherwise I'm going to end up revealing some personal information, which I don't really want to do. Um, and I'm going to have very secure user and password. Um, but now once I tap into done here, I should be able to uh, add notes. And this is a small thing. It's very small, but it's actually incredibly useful. So for example, if you've got a website with a rubbish URL um, and it doesn't really tell you what it is, then you can add a note that uh, this is an example for Twit, for example. Um, and then you will be able to find it more easily later because this is something I know a lot of people like in other solutions like LastPass, who've been sponsored in the show, 1Password, KeePass, Bitwarden, etc. Being able to add a note just allows you to add extra context. You can also uh, use it to store things like, for example, the backup verification codes. But I would note this is not a good field for that because you'll see here, I've, I've tapped done. That, that information is still visible. Um, my password is an easily guessed password, but and that's a warning that it gives you. It doesn't give you a warning that notes are visible, but you can see right there that it is visible. So I would not use this for storing really secure data, but it is something that you can use for storing useful little bits of information. Like for example, if you've got a username and an email address, you can write the email into the notes field. And that's pretty handy to have. Very nice. Yeah, I love that over time, this uh, sort of built-in password manager is getting more and more powerful. Um, as, as time goes on, we get to see those updates that make it easier to just use, and more importantly for me, recommend to family members, friends, and others the built-in password manager, rather than going through the process of setting them up with a third-party password manager like I use. Um, so thank you, Apple and the team, for continuing to improve upon that technology so that we as technologists can uh, continue to insist <laughs> that people use a password manager of some sort to keep their accounts protected. All right. This next one, I'm so excited because Rosemary Orchard is going to show us a demo of this. Folks, we've been waiting for universal control for ages. This is the technology that Apple showed off, they demoed at WWDC that would let you use one mouse and keyboard for your Mac devices, your macOS devices, and your iOS device, well, particularly your iPadOS devices. So you could move uh, your cursor between uh, an iPad that was nearby and back and forth between that and your Mac and use the keyboard as well for those devices. It is kind of mind boggling and was such a cool thing. But uh, throughout the whole period of time that we were testing out the betas of this, universal control was not available for most of that time. And so folks were kind of going, um, are they going to be able to release it? Well, now that iOS 15.4 is here and the latest version of macOS is here, universal control is here. Rosemary, take it away. Right. Well, I'm just going to start with, I've got a Razer Basilisk mouse here, which is connected to my Mac. Um, it's got the the little, um, whatchamacallit, the dongle that's plugged into the charging thing. And I also have a Keychron keyboard, which again is connected to my Mac. These are connected via essentially cables. Um, so there is no funny business going on with the Bluetooth here. Um, but what I'll do is I'll just pop up my iPad and also spoiler, Micah, I did this just now in the password section. I'm just going to mouse over from the right hand side of my screen and I can actually see my cursor from my, my, my iMac 
right here on my iPad. I can scroll up and down. I can use my keyboard shortcuts like Command F um, to find something like if I search for the word pancake in the pancake recipe, I'm going to find it. And I can Command Tab to the next application and just start typing away. Um, so I'm really pleased with this. I've been trying it's this out so for cool. a few days and it's really good. It is marked uh, in Mac OS as a beta feature, um, but it's been working really well for me. And I should note, you can also do this the other way around. So I can't actually do this, unfortunately, uh, with the iPad Air because the iPad Air just doesn't have anything connected to it right now. But if I was using my iPad Pro with a magic keyboard, then I can actually move the cursor from my iPad Pro onto my Mac to do something and then move it back to do something else, which is just amazing. And it works so well, like yeah. really, really well. I am really impressed with it. Um, and I'm, I'm just really pleased that it's out, even if it's officially under a beta flag in the non-beta operating system. It, it works really, really well. Seeing how well it works is what makes me happy that Apple took its time, that you know they weren't ready to release it until they could say, hey, this works very well and we want it to be kind of a seamless experience. It's one of those things where the complexity is so far obscured uh, that when you talk about it, it sounds like it's such a simple thing. And so it doesn't quite sound as mind boggling and awesome as it does when you actually use it and see it in, in action. When you sit down at your desk and you're able to move your cursor between those two different uh, operating mm -hmm. systems and be able to use them. I mean, it is really cool how well it works. It is just slick and it, it opens up the possibilities for me with so much and uh, makes me very excited about kind of how I'll be using it for this show and for other stuff that I work on. All of it is just so fascinating. So yeah, universal control. Um, I think I've, I've seen so many positive uh, reactions to this new way of doing things. And I just hats off to the team behind this uh, and to the team who worked on the original continuity stuff uh, where you've got continuity keyboard, where copying on one device and then being able to paste on an iOS device or vice versa, um, the ability to... Uh, if you're running, say, Safari on your iPad uh, for your nearby Mac to be able to launch Safari to that tab or messages or what have you, all of those different features that work together, uh, the ability to like right click um, in different locations and choose import from iPhone or iPad, uh, this is on the Mac, and then be able mm -hmm. to import photos from those different locations. All of those features that, that have these devices communicating with one another are just so slick and cool. And I just, I love them so much. So congratulations to the team behind all of that stuff. Um, another yes. thing folks should be uh, excited to hear is that um, it seems as if it will get a little bit less risky uh, to try out beta software on uh, the Apple Watch. And that is because Apple Watch firmware can now be restored from an iPhone if the iPhone is running iOS 15.4. If you've mm -hmm. got a watch that's given you lots of trouble uh, and you want to be able to fix that trouble, uh, what needs to happen in many cases, in the, in, the, in the case that it's you know kind of beyond repair from just a reset, is that the firmware needs to be reinstalled and it kind of needs to be sort of a clean slate. And up to this point, you ended up having to send in your device to Apple or going to an Apple store and having them take over. Um, with iOS 15.4, they're trying to put that in the hands of folks where you yourself are able to uh, upgrade or, or reinstall the firmware, restore the firmware to an Apple Watch. So that's handy, yes. super handy. Yes, that is really great. I was at WWDC a few years ago and I was installing uh, the beta watch software on my Apple Watch and it was downloading and I, it had just got to the point where I just clicked install and then I saw a bunch of tweets appearing on Twitter of people going, don't install it, don't install it, it's breaking Apple Watches. And it's like, okay, time to stop, time to stop, like diving for the Apple Watch charger to disconnect it. Fortunately, I didn't install the update, but with this, it would be much easier to roll back if something had gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um, what else do we have here? 
Uh, oh, we well, should. I think we, we we did mention the face ID. Uh, it got an improvement to where you can use face ID with a mask. Uh, when you update your phone, if you have not, as you're listening, when you go to update your phone and you sort of start the install of iOS 15.4, you will be prompted uh, to do some more face ID readings. And all that is doing is providing Face ID a little bit more information about the parts of your face that will be exposed when you are wearing a mask. That way, it has that information and can use that to help verify your identity when it goes about um, trying to scan your face while you're wearing a mask. So uh, my partner just upgraded to iOS 15.4 last night, and he was asking me, why do I have to do Face ID again? And I explained um, that, you know, again, collecting some more data to help you get things figured out.